In this episode, we prepare a turnout for a switch machine, as well as take a look at the m &S tandem loads, and we get smoking with soldering up some power leads. And join Bob Rivard. And also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Soothe the Milwaukee Road. All right, we're dropping in uh, power leads on the southern end of the Hiawatha Elevated District. We're gonna take a look at how we go about doing that from the wire we use, the flux we use, the solder, the soldering iron, and so forth. So a pretty simple skill. We'll cover it in very uh, brief detail, but then we'll also take a look at how to prepare a switch for a servo or a switch machine. <laughs> I just want to give you a short and simple instructional as to how these loads were created. We're going to look at the loads themselves. If you're asking about the cars, um, the custom painting, the decals, all that stuff that is involved with the two flat cars themselves, you can refer back to episode 9 and 10 of Sue the Milwaukee Road. I go into in-depth as far as how I weathered them, how I created them, uh, and that'll cover that particular information. But here we're taking a look at the grain belt models, uh, the culverts. The ones that you're looking at here are 60 inch. This happens to be a multi-pack for the multiple sizes that they do offer. Uh, I did contact Iowa Scaled and asked them if I could get these in bulk. And one nice thing about working with independent or small manufacturers is that they were willing to work with me from a large volume standpoint. I ended up ordering enough of these to be able to uh, create three different tandem sets with varying sizes. And um, they were able to work with me again on a number, which I appreciate that, iowascale.com, as well as um, you know all those small independent manufacturers that are out there that can create that custom stuff, like this particular caboose. This is a Lions West Thrall caboose. Uh, this is one of the, the painted versions that you can order. but. Uh, that is just sitting there for aesthetics. She's a beaut. Looking at the loads themselves, how are they adhered? Uh, first things first is the culverts themselves have been cut down and they have been shot with a tester's chrome paint. So that's what gives it the effect that they have. How are they held together? Well, that's simple. I use KNS. This is 0 0.015 music wire. I end up using a pack and a half of these, so six sticks of this particular size wire. It works out really well to be able to hold the loads together. It's fine enough that uh, you get the effect that you can see here. On the underside, let's pop one of these off. You can see I have a piece of brass. And you say, well, what's with the piece of brass? Well, I do use magnets to be able to hold these things down. And these are rare earth magnets. A rare earth magnet itself, this is a 10 millimeter by five millimeter by two and a half millimeter in size. I end up finding them on eBay. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive for the uh, number of magnets that you get. So you could do an entire load and a half, uh, if not more, just on one order. Uh, we'll take a look at, as you can see, the magnets are moving the load around. I did set just two of these. Underneath, look inside here. If you look down in there, you can see the one magnet uh, that's sitting under the center. In fact, I believe I've got two. I've got a magnet here and a magnet here. So there's two magnets. The piece of brass is just to hold it in place. None of that is glued. How are the wires adhered? Well, they're actually just attached. I create a hook on the end of each of these, pull it around the load, and then I hook them together and then just crimp it to be able to keep it nice and secure. So that gives you an idea of how the load is created. Nicely fastened to the freight car itself. And the beauty of using the magnet system is that once the load is set in place, it's not going anywhere. It's not shuffling and it's not sliding around on the flat car. So it creates a nice load, a way to load it, unload it without creating any issues with the flat car itself. And you're asking, what is it adhering to? Well, this underside of this flat car has its metal weight to be able to hold it in place. And that's what's holding it down. It just sucks down to that piece of metal. And there you have it. The time for the quiz. Pig Zai Yard is just south of this location. This BN train passes through what is known as Hoffman Avenue. If one could turn back the clock, you could see the likes of CBNQ, GN, CNW, Milwaukee Road, and a number of other paint schemes that, well, they shall remain nameless. This is a shot of the final days of Hoffman Tower. As cool as this location is, we've got to ask that question of what year did one of the most unique towers come down? Was it A, 1982? B, 1985? C, 1986? Or was it D, 1987? Let's see what that noodle has to say, and we'll find out later in this episode. 
The progress this week on the railroad is actually going to be the track work itself. As you can see here, I use a straight edge to get the tracks as straight as possible. They're two inches on center. I need to drop wire lead. I ended up using some old scrap wire that was left over on a railroad that Greg Smith and I had torn out. You can't let it all go to waste. I'm using a 1 8 inch drill bit to drill the holes for the wire leads. I'm going to actually drop a lead for every section of track. So as you can see here, I've gone through and drilled one on the inside rail as well as the outside rail. We're going to swing around and take a look at soldering up the leads themselves. And one thing to keep in mind, we're looking at this from the wall side. So the beauty of some of these solders, they're not going to be as nice, but I do the wall side first so I can refine my skill set as I move forward. They get better with time, but the first one that we take a look at here, well, you're going to see in just a moment. One thing to note is the wire gauge. On the side of the wire, it is noted AWG. This one is a 24 gauge wire. Some guys recommend using 18, some say 20. Well, in this case, it just came off an old railroad, so I am going to use this 24 gauge wire. Are you nuts? The bus wire itself a lot of times is recommended to be 12 gauge. That's not what we're concerned about at this moment. We are concerned about actually getting this stripped and prepped for soldering. And by stripped, we're talking about the insulation, not your clothes. Okay, put my pants back on. Zip. After removing the insulation, I do bend the wire into an S configuration to make sure that it sits up against the side of the rail. Looks like an L, but okay. I do use flux to ensure that I get a good bond to the side of the rail itself. It cleans, it fluxes, it protects, it does it all. I end up using the solder to be able to pre-tin the wire and get it ready to be able to stick it to the side of the rail. Pre-tinning is just making sure that you got a little solder on your lead before you stick it to the side of the rail. Stick it to the side of the rail, you gotta stick it to the side of the rail, you gotta stick it to the side of the rail. Once you're all fluxed up as well as pre-tinned, you can apply the heat, and the heat, well, it is heat, so it can melt things. We'll take a look at the joint here in just a moment. In come the critics. Was that Thai rubber? Who's Thai rubber? Oh man, look at the size of that solder blob. Well, it is on the backside. Well, it looks like his backside. So you're saying it looks F-I-N-E. Fine. So that's soldering in a nutshell, and yes, it does get better with time. But as a friend of mine's grandpa used to say, it's good enough for who it's for. Here's something for a non-smoker to collect. Matches and cigarette lighters. Well, I've collected these over the years. There's a Milwaukee Road version. You can see the running Hiawatha in the background. That's just the backside of the lighter. There are a couple of uh, tape measures as well as a Sioux Line lighter and a older Milwaukee Road lighter. Well, that's it for now. Well, have you been sitting there pontificating for the last five minutes as to the answer? Did you guess C, 1986? If you did, you'd be correct. The tower didn't last long enough to see the Minnesota Twins win their first of two World Series. And I think that's two more than the Brewers have ever won. That hurt my feelings. Hey, facts over feelings. Burn. Turnout installation. There are a few things that you can do before actually installing the turnout that can make adding a servo or a switch machine just that much easier. Once I have a track plan that I am happy with, I end up marking the turnout exactly where it's located so I know when I drop it back into place, it's going to go exactly where it belongs. As you can see here, I'm going to prep the turnout. I do cut off this top portion of this Walther's turnout because I don't need this particular mechanism in the way. I am going to run a piece of wire through to be able to throw the turnout itself. I do use a mechanical pencil to mark the throw of the turnout. I just move this left to right by putting it down into the hole. Get in the hole! The next step I take is actually upgrading the rail joiners. The old traditional rail joiner, well, it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing. What we've got here is a Code 83 rail joiner that has the nuts and bolts of the joint bar. Now, you don't have to put in a servo or a switch machine. This is just a good thing to do to prepare just in case. What we've got here is a 1 8 inch drill that we're going to drill straight down and then at the angle. Both angles allow for the smallest hole at the bottom because that's the pivot point of the actual throw. I do use a small piece of wire to be able to clear out the hole as well well as test the throw itself. This is where physics comes into play. If you've got a big sloppy hole, well, I'm going to tell you right now, your turnout isn't going to throw so great. The last order of business is to be able to tie in the actual electrical leads. I do mark those out, and well, we're going to solder them up here as well, so we're just going to kick back and take a look.
Well, as you can see here, we are set. I'll drop this through and I test it from the bottom to make sure that the ground throw is working and it is. So if I want to put on a surface mount ground throw, I can. If I want to put on a servo, I can. The switch is now prepared for the future. Real fanny with regard to go. In the Hiawatha Elevator District. As we pick up the garden job again, we're watching these guys kick some cars. Well, watch this Milwaukee Road Hopper get kicked. Easy does it, boys. Well, it slowly comes to a halt. I want to give you a little history on this particular car. It is one of 500 that were leased from the Transport Leasing Company by the Milwaukee Road. It had the slogan, America's Resourceful Railroad, mounted on a plate. These cars from the inside length were 56 feet, 6 inches, and they were 14 feet, 3 inches tall, and they were 10 feet, 6 inches wide. So if you're really worried about the details, draw bar. Those are a few numbers for you to crunch. <laughs> Give it a kick, Doug. Ha <laughs> ha, that a boy. I don't have time for this. While the car creeps to a stop, this mom couldn't wait. And speaking of couldn't wait, how about that ride? You can check out that sweet seat. I remember those as a kid. If the bike falls over, well, the kid is just going down with it. The parent can bail, but the child, well, not so much. They do continue to sell these particular seats for only a small fortune. If you're looking to ride in one of these, the deluxe version, 191 bones. That seems a little bit steep. But if you're from the 1960s, you got to ride around in this gem. Nothing like strapping a folding chair to the rear tire. One might argue this is actually a little safer. The child at least has the opportunity to bail. No seat belts or safety restraints. And that was the era of the Great Northern. Safety first. As you can see here, the kid's got his head turned. He's kind of checking out the rail action. Let's join him. Oh, Doug's concerned. Got to play traffic cop now. Time to move some cars, boys. We'll uh, close out this section by just watching a little car show. Enjoy some of the vehicles from 1986. Come on, Larry, come on. Here's the curmudgeon coming at you about the crap of the week. What we're talking about this week is all those extra things that you purchase and you find later. I'm telling you right now, you're going to say, oh, I need to get myself some black paint. Next thing you know, you show up at the store. When you get back home, what do you find? But you find black paint. I need to get myself more couplers. Got to end up going to the store. I find myself some new couplers. And what do I find when I get home? I find the couplers. So I tell you right now, look a little harder. I'll keep things organized because I tell you right now, as a model railroader, nothing drives me more nuts than end up getting something I didn't need because I end up finding it. And I think that's the solution. If you're looking for something, go buy it. You'll find it. And that's a curmudgeon's gripe of the week. If you're looking for something, go buy it, you'll find it. A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. If you're looking for something, go buy it, you'll find it. Bye.